Good evening and welcome to PACEIT's webinar, this evening's webinar. And tonight we will be covering CompTIA's A plus exam 220-802. And we're, we are going to be covering their exam objective three, which covers mobile devices. I'm Brian Farrell and I am the instructor and certificate mentor for PACEIT, TNI, that's Technology and Integration Support. I'm also an instructor for Edmonds Community College. There's some of my certifications and qualifications, and let's go ahead and start talking about tonight's webinar. So what is Objective 3? Well, it's all about mobile devices, and it has four sub-objectives under it. Uh, the first one is the mobile operating system. The second portion is basic network connectivity with mobile devices. And then we have how to secure your mobile device and then mobile device hardware. So let's go ahead and begin by talking about the mobile operating system. And the first thing that we get to mention is that Google's Android operating system and Apple's iOS make up the vast majority of the mobile marketplace. Uh, there are some other players in that space, but you know what? They don't even come close to iOS or Android in uh, terms of penetration in the market. I think the next biggest player is Windows, uh, or I should say Microsoft with Windows Phone and the Windows Surface. And <clears throat> I think last time I looked, they were at about a 6 or an 8% market penetration, so not very much. So let's kind of talk about these operating systems. And the first thing that we'll do is we'll talk about Android because they are the biggest player. Now the Android operating system is open source and that means that the operating system can be modified within the constraints of their open source license. As far as hardware goes, anybody can make Android hardware and load the operating system on it. And where can you get apps? Well, Google Play is the largest source of apps for Android devices, but it's not the only source. There are actually several different marketplaces that are out there where you can get applications for your Android device. iOS, on the other hand, uh, Apple being who they are, is closed source. You can only get iOS from Apple, and once you have it, you can't modify it. Not only is the operating system closed or proprietary, their hardware is as well. For the most part, and I'm going to say for the most part, you can only use Apple hardware to run Apple's operating system at least legally. Uh, the only source of apps is Apple's iTunes, so you can only get your applications from Apple. So that's kind of a closed ecosystem. The next largest player would be Windows or Microsoft. <clears throat> You now the operating system is closed source, so it's only available from Microsoft, but the hardware is open source. Anybody can create the hardware to run the operating system. Now, apps are only available from Microsoft's App Store. So Apple, or excuse me, Microsoft is kind of a mix between Android support or Google's approach and Apple's approach, but those are the three big players. Now let's talk about a little bit more about the, the operating systems. And these are some common features that you will find in almost all mobile operating systems. And the first one up is screen orientation. Uh, 
most of them have gyroscopes or accelerometers installed on them and they can tell when you're holding that device in portrait or landscape mode and they will flip their orientation in most cases to fit how you're holding the device. The vast majority of them have GPS's or GPS capabilities so the mobile device is in contact with the satellites and or the cell towers and they can tell where you are uh, within a reasonable amount of distance at any time when they're when they're up and running particularly if you have that feature enabled uh, a lot of the times applications ask if they can use your location to better improve their operation uh, so if you're looking for a restaurant on an app it'll ask if it can use your location and then it'll list the restaurants from closest to farthest away from you another item that a lot of them have is geo tracking now this is similar to GPS but this specifically uses cell towers to track and log device movement um, something that you need to be aware of is a lot of the times in digital forensics they can use that information to track where a device has been. Uh, also some app, apps use and some apps are out there that make that tracking easier. So if you have a teenage son and you want to find out where he's spending his time, guess what you can do? You can use geo-tracking. Now screen calibration. Uh, <clears throat> it's not near the issue that it used to be, uh, but the screen, the touch screen may need to be recalibrated and most of the operating systems have a calibration app in in their settings in their settings sections of the operating system now let's move on to basic network connectivity and that would be under objective 3.2 so let's start let's start with uh, cellular connections many devices can take advantage of cellular data data networks that's kind of a surprise isn't it since we're mostly talking about cell phones um, by the way as the user you need to know how to enable and disable that connectivity for when it's necessary and one of the main reasons why is otherwise additional data charges could be incurred I have kind of an interesting story about incurring data charges when I didn't mean to so if you get a moment you might want to ask me about that but I'm not going to go into it here right now now all of the operating systems allow the user to enable or disable their cellular connections and it's usually done from the settings area of the operating system um, some of them will allow you to do it from the home screens and so on and so forth it does vary by operating system and hardware manufacturer so you should read the uh, instructions on how to do it or research how to turn off your cellular data plan let's talk about the most basic of mobile device networking and that would be Bluetooth so all of these steps are uh, pretty basic all mobile device operating systems allow for Bluetooth connectivity for either headsets or other devices and here's how you do it you enable Bluetooth then you enable pairing you search for the device that you want to pair with and once your mobile device finds the device that you want to pair with a lot of the times it asks you to enter the appropriate pin code and that is the pin code is actually supplied by the device that wants to connect to your mobile device 
Once that's done, they're connected, then you test for connectivity. Like I said, pretty basic. So now let's talk about other things about the mobile device. Uh, one of the nice things about them is it allows you to do things like get your email on the go. So let's talk about email. Uh, so as long as you have an internet connection or a cellular connection, your email is available. But in order to do that, you need to know uh, you need to know some information. So let's run through some of the basics. SMTP, that simple mail transfer protocol, is the protocol that is used to send email from your phone to the email server. It's also the protocol that is used to transfer email between email servers. Uh, you need to know if you are supposed to be using uh, POP3 or IMAP. That's Post Office Protocol 3 or Internet Messaging Application Protocol. I think that's what IMAP stands for. And that is for receiving emails. There are some differences between the two. By the way, you should know what the differences are for when you go to take your Network Plus exam. You also need to know the fully qualified domain name, the FQDN, for your email provider. whether and you need to know that FQDN for both the SMTP or for the POP3 or IMAP servers. And the final thing that you need to know is whether or not your email provider requires SSL or TLS security for connecting to their servers. Now that we got that covered, let's kind of dig in just a little bit deeper. So the, the most common SMTP port is 25 unless of course you're running SMTPS which is the secure version and then the most common port is 465. Most common port for POP3 is 110. Uh, POP3 secure is port 90, well, excuse me, 995. And IMAP is 143 unless you're running secure and then it's 993. Those are the most common. I won't guarantee that those are your port settings that you that you need. Uh, I've got a story about that as well, so ask me about it later. If you were going to set up a Gmail account on your mobile device, the fully qualified domain name, the FQDM for POP3, would be POP period Gmail period. Dot com and Gmail is secure, so they use POP3 secure, and they use it on port 995, so they use the default port. Their SMTP, last time I looked, was SMTP period Gmail period dot com, and they use port 587. By the way, that is actually the default for TLS, uh, Transport Layer Security. So that's what you would need to, to plug into your email program on your mobile device in order to send and receive email through Gmail. So now let's talk about some other things. Let's talk about synchronizing data. So each mobile operating system uses its own method to synchronize data. You need to refer to your vendor for their specific process. Now, any type of data can be synchronized in mobile devices, and usually you're synchronizing with a, either a PC or a laptop. It's a good idea to synchronize your data. If nothing else, it allows you to have a backup. So common things that get synchronized include contacts from mobile phones, uh, programs, emails, photos, music, videos, so on and so forth. Whatever you have on your mobile device can pretty much be synchronized to a computer. So why synchronize? Well, it provides protection against lost equipment and 
and it allows for the free movement of data. It allows you to keep that data current. If you synchronize, if you have it set correctly, you can uh, work on your mobile device and it can automatically synchronize it back to your PC. <clears throat> Most of them do use their own applications to provide synchronization. I know that if you have an, an Apple device, they use iTunes, much to a lot of people's dismay. Uh, I've never had too many problems with it, but a lot of people don't like it. There are some other ways that are, excuse me, there are some connection types that you can use for synchronization which would be your wireless or cellular method. Uh, and nowadays, most of them offer a cloud service. I know that Apple does. I know that Microsoft does. I'm not sure about Google. I'm pretty sure they do. To where whatever you do on your phone actually gets automatically synchronized through your data connection to the cloud so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, there's wireless synchronization, and that's for when you're on your home network. I tend to use that one most often at home. You can use USB. That means connecting to your mobile device and then directly to whatever you're going to sync it with. That's the other main method that I use at home. Uh, Bluetooth synchronization is available, is available, but it's not that common. And finally, there's infrared. That used to be the way that we did it in the past, particularly if you had, um, man, now I can't remember the name of it. Palm Pilot. There we go. Palm Pilots tended to use infrared when they came out, at least first off when they came out. That type of synchronization is a little bit slow and you're limited to line of sight. I really wouldn't recommend it anymore just because we use a whole lot more data now and the synchronization or the sync would take just forever. Now let's talk about securing the mobile device. That would be objective 3.3. Why do we need to talk about securing your mobile device? Well. Because they're, because they're mobile, they are susceptible to loss and theft. Well, just about everyone has either lost a device or had one stolen, and that's quite a bummer. So you should protect against it. Uh, in the early years, when you lost your cell phone, as I put here in the, in the slide, the major concern was that your cell phone or your SIM was going to be used for international calls. It wasn't that uncommon for you to lose your phone call or to lose your phone. And by the time you'd get to your uh, cellular carrier to let them know that you lost your phone, they'd already racked up a couple of thousand dollars in international phone calls. Um, But now there's other things that are of concern if you uh, lose your mobile device. And a lot of that has to do with personal data that is on the device. So how do we secure mobile devices? Well, your first line of defense is making sure that you have a passcode enabled. That means that unless you're using the device, the device it is locked. Now your passcodes are usually a four digit PIN that needs to be entered to uh, unlock the phone. A lot of them nowadays have failed login restrictions and you get to determine what happens. So what's a failed login restriction? So you enter in the passcode or somebody enters in the passcode and it's the wrong code. That's a failed login. You get to determine what happens if too many if uh, too many attempts are made, that's usually a sign that somebody other than you has your phone. Uh, some of them allow you to actually set set it to completely wipe the device. Uh, some of them will lock them down for a period in time. It's like I said, it's up to you 
to determine it. Many mobile devices nowadays come with a locating service. It uses GPS and geo tracking. So in case you lose your device or it's been stolen, if it's turned on, these locating applications can usually find your device. And the last thing that I'll say is uh, remote backup applications or syncing your device. Backing up your data is always crucial. Um, now let's talk about your last line of def last line of defense, and that would be things like your remote wipe. I haven't had to do this yet. I'm pretty sure as things go forward, sooner or later I will have to. I tend to keep a lot of information on my devices. I don't want other people having that information. I have remote wipe enabled on my device as a security measure just in case I lose it. And as I said there, your last another part of your last line of device uh, defense is backing up your data. So let's talk about some other things. Well, in the early days of uh, mobile networking, we didn't have to worry too much about malware for phones or tablets. That's rapidly changing. So as techno technology progresses, more and more malware is being developed for mobile devices. The largest target currently is Android. Does that mean everybody else is exempt? No. That just means that since they are the vast majority of the market, that's what malware is being written for. So you need to be careful on where you get your apps. Um, as a matter of fact, I'd actually recommend doing research before you even download an app from Google Play. Talking about research, so the first thing that I'll say about securing your mobile device and the best way to protect it is user education. You need to know and practice safe mobile networking habits. Uh, patching your operating system, you need to keep your device up to date. That's one of the best ways to uh, mitigate threats and vulnerabilities. Only acquire your apps from trusted sources. And in particular for Google, I would actually do research before I downloaded any app to make sure that it was safe. Sometimes uh, malware gets through the process. doesn't tend to last very long on Google Play, but you don't want to be one of those people that actually downloads malware from there. Your second line of defense, well, now there's antivirus. It's starting to come out for uh, for mobile devices. So as the popularity of the mobile devices has increased, the market for antivirus has increased. But given the nature of mobile devices, not all malware will work on all devices. They tend to be tailored for the specific operating system. So again, you need to do your research to make sure that the malware app or the antivirus app that you're trying to download or use will work for your device. Well, <clears throat> so now let's talk about mobile device hardware, which is objective 3.4. So another surprise, mobile devices provide a smaller form factor for the user than either laptops or PCs. That's kind of a shocker, isn't it? Well, because the small because of the smaller form factor, that's led to some differences in the hardware that's used in mobile devices. So what am I talking about? Well, first off, mobile devices, they do not have field serviceable parts. Uh, they're difficult to take apart without specialized equipment. 
And as a general rule, you can't really take them apart unless it's to get to the batteries, and even that is becoming more and more rare. Most of the components are soldered in place, as in the processors and RAM are actually soldered to the main board, so you can't even get to them. And by the way, as I put here, that's also becoming more common in laptops. And the main thing about mobile devices is they are not upgradable. What you, what you buy is what you get. So you might want to do your research on the specs to make sure that that device is going to do or be capable of doing what you want it to do. Now, all mobile devices have solid state drives. Uh, just just because a spinning disk wouldn't work very well being carried around in your pocket subject to all the shock and whatnot. Mobile devices also come with a touch interface. I don't think there's any mobile device out there that is not touch enabled. And when we're talking about touch enabled, there are a couple of different types of things that you should be aware of. There's multi-touch. So what that does is the screen can actually register more than one point of touch. That allows us to do the things like pinch and zoom. Because uh, it can actually tell when you pinch your fingers together or when you spread them out. There's also what is called touch flow, and we use that for swiping. So it can tell when your finger moves across the screen. So not only can you touch on something to click it on your screen, but you can use multi-touch and touch flow to navigate. And that actually covers it for all of the objectives of the CompTIA's A plus exam 220-802 objective three. Thank you for attending this webinar.